we've had seven speakers till date and i am so so grateful to each and every one um, you know we've had a stellar lineup of of speakers from all over the world busy people excellent you know um um scholars and they've taken out their time to come on on a weekend to speak to us it is much appreciated and also to each and every one of your academic representatives who also take out time on your weekend some of your some of your colleagues or people in your cohort are using this time to watch netflix you know binge on netflix and um, do other things but you're using this time to invest in your intellectual ability and capacity and i can assure you that you will not regret this as james gatti said last in the last um lecture that was given he said that he wishes that he had something like this when he was in university so do i i wish i had the opportunity to be exposed early on not just international economic law but to critical perspectives of international economic law perhaps we would have gone further than we have already gone or we have achieved at the, at the moment but that's why we are happy to be able to to pass the baton on to you and we know you're going to do great and excellent things moving forward so um I'll hand over to BC. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot um, to Dr. Umune and thanks to everyone in the um, in the team that leads this very important uh, group uh, of. Um, of imagine, right, scholars of international economic law uh, in Africa. Uh, I think it's a very important group because uh, I agree with first with everything that Joe Muni has said, but it's worth emphasizing that uh, the, the importance of being exposed so early to some of these ideas um, cannot be overemphasized. Uh, a lot of us, at least I can say of myself, um, learned this subject by ourselves. Uh, I did not sit in a classroom where I was taught international economic law in the context of Africa at all. Uh, so, uh, and that's the story of many. Uh, and so you have to, like he has said, and I'm sure many of the scholars I had who have guest lectured here have said, take this as an important opportunity to really develop your interest in the field uh, very early on. Uh, so, so today is, is a very interesting one because um, when um, over some time now, I've been in contact with, the, uh, with some of the lead team to say, uh, uh, I look forward to being here. Uh, and so uh, the, perhaps the latest one was almost uh, informal when I was told I have to, I'm the next or something like that. I was just like, okay, um, I'm happy to share something that I have prepared and it's forthcoming on the AFCFTA uh, with the team here. Uh, so my plan today is to offer some reflections on, on an aspect, uh, not the entire piece, on an aspect of the chapter that contributed to a book that is forthcoming uh, in the summer of this year. But the title of, of, my, of my reflection today, as, as I've uh, called it, is really one that looks at the uh, peculiar position uh, uh, that African states are vis-a-vis -vis the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. Uh, and that I call locating right, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement uh, in the contending visions of Pan-Africanism. It is deliberately stated so uh, because uh, I hope, as I've known this group to be, uh, to provoke some thought uh, as I intend to take this particular aspect further. Uh, uh, so the premise of the paper is, is one that African states are not monolithic in the way they think policy-wise, uh, that international economic law policies at the national level differ, uh, and in fact, they are not concrete, which means they're very fluid in the way they move. So uh, Nigeria, for example, in my view, does not say this is our policy 
and that it remains so for the next uh, three years, for example, it really uh, moves and changes fast with various factors that I'll speak to. Number two is that, uh, number sec the second premise is that uh, the CFTA is uh, being predicated on the efficacy of the regional economic communities on the continent um, is a problematic um, uh, idea that has been drafted into the, into the agreement. Uh, on the one hand, one may argue, as I'll speak to shortly, that there's wisdom in building on the regional economic communities and the ACQUI, uh, the law, uh, that has been developed by these regional economic communities to build the AFCFTA. That I agree with, but you do have to ask yourself whether we have also bought into the problems uh, that the regional economic communities have had hitherto. And the third one will be, which is another premise in paper, to ask ourselves how the um, uh, Africa's position in the global economic uh, order uh, really impacts the AFCFTA because we cannot imagine this agreement outside of the context of the interaction between African states and various uh, international economic uh, actors outside of the continent. Okay, so those are the premise uh, uh, that I want to set out there to then get into some of the discussions that I'll have. But, but without assuming too much, let me speak to uh, briefly what the AFCFTA is, you know, the current state of things, uh, before getting back to some of those uh, points that I have noted. By now, we all probably uh, get the idea that the AFCFTA itself is um, an agreement that is now in force. Uh, and primarily, that happened as a result of the crystallization uh, of the numbers uh, and the eventual kicking into force on January 1st, 2021. And so officially trading, quote and unquote, right? Uh, because uh, uh, the formal announcement, the formal meet of the requirements for trading is quite different from the practicality of trading happening on the ground. And so this is the formal requirement, right? Of, of kicking off trading started on that January 1st, 2021. By that date though, we already had 54 out of the 55 countries on the continent signed on to the AFCFTA, not necessarily ratified. By this morning though, they have become 37. As that yesterday night, it was maybe 36, but Botswana has now deposited its instrument of ratification with the Secretariat of the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. So we are at number 37 states that have ratified the AFCFTA. Now that is great. It's a huge uh, political show of support uh, to have gotten that far with this agreement. And of course, of that 37, there are uh, 19 least developed countries that have uh, deposited their uh, instruments of ratification. Well, you might ask yourself, why is it important to understand the uh, classification of the states uh, that have deposited? Uh, well, it's, it's an indication of something uh, that I'll get to shortly. If you think about the fact that not all the, that the big states, so to say, not all the big states on the continent have been at the forefront. For example, Nigeria has not yet completed its own ratification. Uh, so, so you have to think about what does that mean if Nigeria is delaying and some other least developed states have, uh, have done theirs. Now the AFCFTA, uh, which is the phase one that, that we are living in currently, uh, really covers goods, services, and there was a protocol relating to the dispute settlement mechanism of the agreement itself. So for the overall aim of this agreement, its purpose is to liberalize, right, by way of elimination of uh, tariffs, right, that hinder uh, goods, movement of goods uh, uh, within the African continent and services, but to also over time uh, progressively liberalize trade and services 
in order to promote the production, or if you like, industrialization uh, of the African continent. One appreciates the importance of this particular agreement in the sense that if you look at the history um, of, of, the, of the continent, one area that a lot has not always happened is in the area of formal trade uh, within African states, right? Uh, between, excuse me, African states. That has not happened a lot as yet, at least in comparison to formal trade with states outside of the continent or vis-a-vis -vis informal cross-border trade, uh, which has happened uh, a lot more than the formal one. The services sector uh, has also been prioritized, as I've said in the, in the first phase, uh, and as such, core things such as tourism, professional services, computer services, financial services, and transport are the core of a lot of the services bucket. Uh, that we're talking about. Now, today I don't plan to get to the dispute settlement management area. I want to stick at the conceptual level uh, to be able to get into some of the core questions I put out at the beginning. But before coming back to that, it's important to also sort of get a sense of what it means technically uh, once we're thinking about the notion of liberalizing trade. What, what do we mean? Does this mean that Everything is now open between Nigeria and Kenya and, you know, Nigeria and Ghana and, you know, Botswana and Tanzania. What does it mean? Well, in technical terms, what it means is that African countries that ratify the agreement consent to liberalize 90% of their tariff lines, right? So this is critical. This is not 100% liberalization on day one. No, it's actually 90% at the top. This is key because what it means is that they will reduce and ultimately seek to eliminate the tariffs on those goods that are in the 90% of the products that countries have designated uh, to liberalize, to go with. There's a 10% that is archived, right? Which I'll get to that in a short while. Uh, the least developed countries within the continent uh, are expected to accomplish their own liberalization over a longer period than the developing ones. And what this means is that there's an idea, what is technically called variable geometry, that is built into this process that allows these particular least developing countries to do theirs over a longer period of time to be able to catch up with the deficit they have vis-a-vis -vis the developing ones. And that is fine if you're thinking about the fact that trade by its nature has distributive effects, the way it lands on states differ, the implication it has for every state differ. And so this is a good thing that has been done uh, in terms of the least developed countries. So they have 10 years to do this uh, liberalization, whereas the developing ones uh, have uh, five years to do so. All right, so if we get that, what do we do with the 10% that is left? Uh, well, in that particular one, you would see the regulatory space that member states have is preserved. It is preserved in a sense that there is a 7% of tariff lines that will then be fully liberalized over another period of time that differs both for the LDCs and the developing country members. For the LDCs, over another 13 year period, you'll be able to say, okay, we have another 7% tariff line that we have things we want to put in that bucket. Whereas for the developing country members, they have another 10 years to do so. Now, so that brings us to 97%. There's still 3% left, right, at the end of the day. Um, those 3% is excluded completely from the realm of trade liberalization. Countries preserve that. So for example, Kenya may say, well, I want to preserve my... Um, uh, I don't know, fly industry, horticulture industry. I don't want to liberalize that at all, right? Because that brings in a lot of money for our government. 
Uh, I don't want to liberalize my rubber or cocoa or, you know, coffee. Uh, whichever one, they have that regulatory freedom. Uh, to do that in that bucket. So I think it is critical for us to get a sense of the I, of the fact that once you talk about trade liberalization, we're not at 100% from day one. And that it is important to also understand that even though we start at the top of 90%, that we gradually break this down to the 7% uh, that, is, that is left, uh, and then the 3%, but also understand the relationship vis-a-vis the developing countries and the least developed countries. Okay, so a little bit of technical information in there, uh, but one that is critical for you to understand how this game plays out on the ground. The other one that I think is important to emphasize is the fact that there are, once you think about the AFCFTA agreement itself, there are five additional instruments that will support the implementation of the AFCFTA agreement. Its, oper its operationalization uh, rides on the back of number one, the rules of origin. Very technical thing, one which I'm not an expert at, uh, but one which the member states are still negotiating. They haven't concluded that. Uh, but that is a very important document uh, that really details what these tariffs are, what goods are there, the percentage. And in terms of the chain of understanding, this really will be implemented by those custom officers at the borders, right? So if you've seen reports in the East African in newspapers across the continent, where complaints have arisen in recent times about the fact that uh, uh, trailers continue to encounter bottlenecks at, at the border, is because things are not yet clear. Right, and haven't also devolved completely uh, to that particular end uh, for them. But that is on the works. So the rules of energy origin is, is, is supposed to ensure that products traded within the market actually originate from within the continent. You see, so it's important piece of this particular agreement. You don't want items to be imported from outside the continent and rebranded as produced within the continent and then sold in the free trade area, you see? Uh, so that's a practicality that that is meant to, to address. Number two is that there's an online portal for tariff negotiation. Uh, and that is supposed to facilitate discussions between states, custom unions, and the regional groupings uh, on trade liberalization. Number three, there's an online mechanism for monitoring, reporting, and elimination of non-tariff barriers, which is key. NTB is a very big problem uh, hitherto in inter-African and intra-African trade, uh, trade regime. Number four, there's a Pan-African payment and settlement mechanism, uh, which has been supported uh, by the Afrexin Bank, uh, so that deserves uh, mentioning, which makes it possible for African companies to clear and settle intra-African trade transactions in their local currencies. This is critical. Uh, because if you think about what it means for trade to be conducted uh, in USD, uh, then that has ripple effect uh, on how we think about the cost and the pricing and just the overall administration uh, in the finance buckets of this particular scheme. And lastly, there's what's called the African Trade Observatory, the purpose of which is to provide stakeholders uh, with up-to-date, reliable trade data, as well as information about exporters and importers in countries. That five uh, body of uh, schemes are to support the implementation uh, of the FCFTA goods and services and overall trade liberalization agenda. Now, that, that is good. Th those are all very fantastic initiatives. Uh, and they will be, uh, I hope, you know, they, they are implemented to the T uh, so that the maximum benefits can be derived uh, from this particular schemes. But for now, uh, they are work in progress uh, to a large extent. Now, what has not been done or what is being done currently by way of negotiation? Uh, well, so phase two really is about intellectual property. Uh, it's about competition law. Uh, it's about investment protocol. Uh, and as I gather now, data governance has been added to that, to that matrix. Now, these are all being negotiated as part of the phase two uh, of the AFCFTA, AFCFTA 
Uh, and you can appreciate that, you know, these are all very complex uh, fields that are not so easy uh, to, to be put together in one framework. As such, one appreciates the fact that this has been divided uh, into two broad negotiation phases. So that's just a, you know, a bird's eye view uh, of appreciating what this agreement is about uh, without, without really going into details. And just to put this out there, if you're thinking about what's the dispute settlement like? Well, it really mimics to a large extent uh, the World Trade Organization dispute settlement uh, mechanism. Uh, and I've written about that in other, in other pieces that I've done. Okay, so let's come to, to what I see as a very interesting theme uh, in all of this. I, I mean, I appreciate that uh, with an agreement such as the AFCFTA, uh, really implementing it is, is, uh, is not going to be done on a very empty uh, basis, right? Uh, we're not going to be doing uh, this particular uh, uh, AFCFTA uh, drive and its trade liberalization agenda uh, on an empty phase uh, or tabula rasa. Uh, so in my own chapter here, what I sought to do was not to address all the problems uh, that, uh, that one might face. You, you can talk about problems arising from infrastructure uh, 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 that we have on the continent. You can think about knowledge asymmetry, for example, uh, for, for those officers at the forefront of the implementation of this agreement. You can talk about whether uh, the citizens really know what these agreements are for, uh, for them. So you can appreciate that a lot of national consultation processes that are being done at this time uh, is geared towards addressing to some extent the impact of that. Uh, you can think about the fact that, uh, how do we think about the AFCFT and informal uh, sector, right? How does that marry together. So there are many problems you can, you can identify, in fact, in non-tariff barriers and so on. But that's not what I've looked at. In the chapter, I've sought to address some of those in part, uh, but to also then uh, move a little bit in situating this agreement in a broader narrative that goes back uh, to the history of how uh, maybe state diplomacy, if you like, interstate diplomacy, uh, happens in Africa, which is that uh, these states uh, really understand that uh, they support each other. They, there's the, there's the Pan-African ideals that you can talk about. Uh, but at the heart of it is a call for more uh, uh, nuanced understanding uh, of what you can think of uh, uh, for, for, for what it means for, for each of the African states to think about their national uh, interests vis-a-vis -vis the regional ones at the end of the day. And so I call that uh, situating uh, the AFCFTA in the contending visions of Pan-Africanism uh, in the continent. The premise to that is that Pan-Africanism does not mean one thing. Uh, Pan-Africanism is, is a very empty uh, 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 concept in the sense that it is a construct uh, that, is, uh, that is constantly made up uh, to mean something uh, during each phase uh, uh, of a particular move on the continent. And so on the one hand, it is okay to say, oh, that African states, uh, 54 of them have signed the treaty is, is, a, is an idea of uh, that 54 uh, of the 55 uh, member states have signed signals a notion of Pan-Africanism. That is true. Uh, that is okay. But, but what version of, of Pan-Africanism is that? How is that still Pan-Africanism when you put it against the fact that we only have 37 uh, that has ratified? Well, you might say, well, maybe the others are just going through the motions and will eventually get there. Okay, that's true. Uh, but how does this play against the fact that at the regional level that we've seen over a longer period of time, uh, we see protectionist tendencies play out. You see Kenya putting out policies that, you know, lock out goods that are coming from Tanzania, for example. You don't see a lot of Rwanda, Kenyan uh, uh, economic free flow. You don't see Nigeria and, and Ghana uh, really exhibiting all the hallmarks uh, of, intra, of, of integration. You don't see South Africa and Nigeria uh, playing out very well, ex ex especially against, against the notions of xenophobia, 
uh, and race in, in international economic law. How do you think about Pan-Africanism once situated in those lands? That's what I sought to do in the latter part of that particular chapter, which I am taking up uh, in the further paper that I'm, that I'm doing. Uh, so what I see said in that paper is that beyond the symbolic power uh, of the AFCFTA, which is what that first flurry of signing and celebration shows, uh, scholars have raised concerns about the extent to which the AFCFTA uh, truly engenders a fair, equitable, and radically different future uh, for the continent. Uh, and it's important to, to really get a sense here that we're talking about a continental move uh, that drives the majority uh, of the African continent uh, in a very different future. It may be difficult to drag everybody along, every state along, uh, but you imagine that the majority of the states will seek to benefit from this uh, new order. Of course, it's not a new thing uh, that, you know, African states have really been at the forefront of various forms of regional economic uh, integration schemes, uh, celebrated conclusions, and so on and so forth. Uh, but what is clear is that uh, since colonization and intensified post-colonization, African states have devolved into, a, as I argue in the paper, a hodgepodge of highly stratified economies with widening inequalities. And so we go back to how I started talking about the developing countries and the least developing countries. Uh, this is where these are layered, right? Uh, that we have various levels of defeat, division and stratification uh, amongst the African countries. This has come with deep-seated structural inequalities uh, in the socioeconomic realm, uh, as well as you know, power symmetry amongst African states. Uh, so, for example, you can think about, you know, what scholars have also called regional hegemons. Uh, you think about Nigeria, you think about Egypt, you think about Kenya, you think about South Africa, uh, maybe to some extent you think about Morocco. Uh, you can make arguments uh, for some of these other states, but these are regional hegemons at the end of the day. And what it means is that they wield economic power that are not comparable to their fellow integrating states. This means a lot. Uh, the pandemic that we have seen uh, and we've all lived in the past uh, year has shown various levels of stratification uh, and has deepened this division uh, furthermore. And so despite the long history uh, that, that African states have with respect to economic uh, uh, cooperation, what you see is that there's a significant level of vulnerabilities that, that, that exists pre-pandemic that are deepened post-pandemic when we get there, right? But that have deep-seated roots uh, to early post-colonial states and the formation uh, of these particular entities. So then what does this mean, right? Uh, my argument is that the AFCFTA, uh, while it seeks to create this new umbrella at the continental level that's supposed to drive the continent towards a new trade liberalization agenda, which should be celebrated for what it does, it also intensifies, I argue, or the density, I argue, the density of fragmented sub-regional economic levels, right? We now have one more big umbrella to contend with. The regions are trying to do their bit, uh, but we have to now think about how it sinks uh, with the AFCFT, and I'll illustrate this with examples uh, in a short while. So to do this particular one, I found an article which uh, uh, Rita Abrahamson wrote, very instructive uh, for that section of the, of the chapter that has been shared with you all. Uh, she's a political scientist, uh, but she's written a lot about the continent as well as she was uh, actually on my doctoral committee when I did my, my doctoral work. So a lot of Pan-Africanists, I mean, a lot of political scientists have thought about notions of Pan-Africanism, right? Legal scholars have done so too, but I found her own take on it very interesting uh, and compelling. And Abrahamson, uh, as I will call her going forward, analysis uh, really situates the contending visions uh, of the ideology of Pan-Africanism uh, in Africa in, as one that, you know, really mimics uh, ideas that, that are fluid, that are overlapping, that are morphological, 
to our, and, and critical to our understanding of the idea of Pan-Africanism. Uh, in other words, it doesn't mean one thing, right? It's fluidity changes as you think about policies uh, that nations give. It changes vis-a-vis, -vis, let me give a concrete example. You think about the uh, uh, European Union Economic Partnership Agreement, right? Uh, you think about, and let's use Kenya again, uh, you think about Kenya as a state, uh, you think about the AFCFTA, then you think about the US-UK FTA, right? I, I mean, look at those, try to connect them. What is going on? When Kenya says, for example, we support the AFCFTA, but now we're signing US-Kenya FTA, we're signing US-UK-Kenya um, uh, FTA, uh, and then other states within the region are like, well, we want to go alone. We're going for the UK EPA, for the EU EPA. What, what is going on? Why are the states pulling apart to do these sort of things, right? Uh, these are contending visions of Pan-Africanism. That's what we're talking about, right? You, th those, those are the states really triggering what they see as aligning the most with their interests. In other words, in some situations, these states recognize that going to bed with Kenya really doesn't just favor them, they rather just go on with the EU, period. That's what it means. And so this really throws up a very important uh, problem for us to, to really analyze with a very careful uh, understanding here. So uh, what I sought to do was to build on that. And perhaps one more quote from, 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 from uh, Richard Abrahamson's piece. Uh, she argues that Pan-Africanism contains, quote, contains internal tensions and fissures. Pan-Africanism contains multiple variations and inflections, right? And all of these ideas adapt, they mutate in their interaction with global events. That is fascinating, right? That looks like what I've just described, right? It, it looks like nations have various ideas of how they want to go uh, depending on who they're acting with. And that doesn't uh, uh, that, that changes, right, depending on who the party is. Let me give you another example, uh, which sort of shows what I'm trying to say here. You look at how various European uh, states today have come up with uh, African strategy. Switzerland has an African strategy. The EU has an African strategy. Uh, Finland has an African strategy. Well, what's this? The US has an African strategy. Right? So how does these also, and of course the Chinese government have their own African strategy. India would have one, Japan will have one. So what is it that is going on? At another level, you can make these arguments that these are externalities, uh, something which I agree with, right? That impacts on how we think uh, about the, the role of external actors on the continent, that is true. But what does this say of the role of states within the continent vis-a-vis -vis those actors? It's contending visions of Pan-Africanism. So for me, uh, uh, not only is Pan-Africanism not a neutral value, I argue, uh, its meaning at any point is constituted by social interactions, socioeconomic and political interactions with prevailing ideologies of international economic order. I mean, one more quote from Rita is that for her, she argues that the contending and evolving visions of the world order within Pan-Africanism, a world of racially defined units, a world of continental unity and transactional solidarity, and a world of national sovereignty. That is at the core of my argument, that Africans are transact African states are transactional in their dealing uh, with, with themselves and with African, with, with fellow, fellow states outside of the continent. There's nothing wrong with that except that it matters for our understanding of how we consider an agreement as important as the AFCFTA. And perhaps we shouldn't overpromise about its potential uh, at the early stage as we're thinking uh, of, of, of driving towards the end of my own arguments uh, in this presentation today. And so you look at it and you pull it further. My argument is a very simple one, uh, as I said in the chapter. Uh, basically, it is that African regional trade regimes in general, and the AFCFTA project in particular, have not paid sufficient attention to the mutability and fluidity of Pan-Africanism in the discourses of economic cooperation in Africa. 
particularly as it relates to the implementation phase of the trade agreements that we are in now. And it is playing out before us, unfortunately. We are now in the implementation phase. Kenya is doing its thing. Uh, various states continue to still delay. Uh, we see bilateral agreements, you know, rising. Uh, and so this is the very thing. Yet we see a celebration, right, contemporaneously of how we're supposed to work uh, with this uh, AFCFTA vision. Let me lay out this on specific example from the Southern African development uh, community, and then I'll end. There is what is called the Tripartite Free Trade Area Agreement, right? Uh, which has, you know, the COMESA, the EAC, and the SADIC members. And in between them, you have 22 member and partner states that have signed on to the TFTA. Uh, as I'll refer to it going forward. Now, the TFTA predated uh, the AFCFTA, and it's celebrated as this big thing too when, we, when it was started and when, when African states that were parties to it uh, started moving towards its own uh, completion. The problem though is that to date, we only have 10 of the member states that have ratified uh, the TFTA out of the 22. Now, they don't need all the 22 uh, to ratify it. They only need uh, 14 of them for that particular agreement to come into being. Why is this critical? Here we're thinking about the fact that the operationalization of the AFCFTA is dependent to a large extent on the healthy well-being uh, of the regional trade agreements. And so what is the link between the TFTA and the AFCFTA, right? Well, this is where it gets interesting that until the TFTA as an agreement kickstarts, a lot of its own member states cannot trigger the benefits that they have under it in its interaction with the AFCFTA. So to the extent that the AFCFTA, the, the, the Tripartite Free Trade Area Agreement, uh, remains you know, dominant till today, uh, its member states interaction or triggering its relationship with the AFCFTA remains significantly open and that nothing is being done. Uh, so of the 10 member states, uh, five, you know, are SADC member states, for example, and that's Botswana, Eswani, uh, Namibia, South Africa, and Zambia. Uh, and the specific provision uh, in the Tripartite Free Trade Area Agreement that I'm referencing is Article 39, uh, subparagraph 3, which provides that the agreement will come into force once 14 of the member states have ratified, member or partner states have ratified it. And so, as I've said, what it means is that connecting it to the context of the AFCFTA, it means until you have that particular uh, aspect triggered, then its overlap with the AFCFTA remains open and nothing is gonna happen uh, from the TFTA uh, side of things. We might even put that aside and ask ourselves what is happening uh, in the Nigerian, Ghana, uh, West African context. Now, there are national consultations going on in Nigeria currently, uh, which is geared towards uh, really gathering uh, the, the significant number uh, of, of ideas to understand the benefits of this particular agreement for, for Nigeria. But I think there's a problem in there. Uh, and one my, which my argument really is, is centered on the role of not external actors, uh, but African entrepreneurs, African capitalists uh, in thinking about uh, the AFCFTA. There are many rich Africans that own uh, businesses across the continent. Uh, without mentioning too many, there's a certain Dangote refineries, Dangote sugar, Dangote rice, Dangote that, that's on uh, in Nigeria and across different parts of the continent. And to a large extent, these are important actors in how we think. Uh, about uh, policies of government uh, and what they mean for the liberalization of particular products uh, and the ease with which nation states uh, actually open up their borders uh, to, to the AFCFTA trade liberalization agenda. My argument along those lines uh, is very narrow. And the idea is that, look, these capitalists uh, are interested in protecting their interests. Uh, at the policies that we've seen up to now at the national level have enhanced these businesses. It has protected them. They've been able to infiltrate the executive uh, to be able to, to put policies in place that allows their business to grow, 
Now, that's not a bad thing if you're thinking about what it means for a corporation or a company to develop expertise in a particular area uh, in the national context. But once it comes to opening up the borders uh, for other countries to be able to trade with you in respect of the same goods that those particular capitalists are interested in, there's a problem that arises, right? And you can think about that in the context of rice, you can think about that in the context of cement, you can think about that in the context of tomato paste uh, in the Nigerian context. And you can situate that in the ongoing border closure uh, that Nigeria has in its West African context against its neighboring states. And so, so that at the end of the day, I mean, I'm, I'm really curious to hear you guys thought because this aspect of the chapter is now a standalone piece that I'm developing. But my, my claim uh, to, to sort of end this is that the AFCFTA to start with is an important document. It is a project with a lot of promise, but promises sometimes are just promises uh, if we don't really uh, drive them to actualization. I mean, I can be like, oh, Collins, uh, I'll give you six books, uh, you know, uh, do what you will with them. I promise to send them to you, right? It's a promise until he gets them. If he doesn't get the book, then nothing is done. And so you think about those 90% uh, trade liberalization tariffs that, that I've mentioned, you think about a 7%, you think about a 3% space that countries have to not put anything in the bucket of trade liberalization. You think about the rules of origin, you think about customs, uh, you think about what I've not talked about, infrastructure, which I'm happy to highlight uh, if you want that. And you ask yourself, where are we going? This is not fetishizing the problem we have. That's not my argument. I'm not saying we can't surmount uh, some of these challenges. Indeed, what I'm saying is that quite apart from the challenges that are obvious to us, we have not gone past the threshold of deep seated national thinking amongst African states. And that this notion of Pan-Africanism runs into significant tension once we think about the interest of powerful African states vis-a-vis -vis the AFCFTA. I don't know what it means for the future of the AFCFTA, but it is an area that I hope that the folks at the AFCFTA Secretariat and, and the AU, uh, Ethiopia, uh, and the regional bodies will come together to meaningfully uh, address. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, so we've come to the first part of our session, of which I'm sure all of us have found enlightening in the, re in the issues and the opportunities for um, reform or development that Professor BC has brought up. And at this point, um, I would wish to therefore open up to the audience on to have to bring about any questions or comments that they would have. However, the obviously for purposes of structure, um, perhaps the preferred system would be that those who we shall do a mixed, mixed session for those who have any questions, you can either type them to the chat or raise your hand up using the um, feature, the Zoom feature of Zoom reaction of raising your hand. And I will note it and um, bring about the question to the, to, of course, to the audience. Thanks. So, of course, I will start with the first question here, um, which has come from Professor Ohio. And his question to Professor Olabisi is, how do we address the problematic aspects of the AFCFTA, such as articles 18 and 19, dealing with continental preferences and the place of the regional economic communities, RECs, given the lethargy the RECs have generally had in guaranteeing ambitious integration? Yeah, I mean, that's, um, that's a very interesting question. And uh, Professor uh, Omiyunu sent it to me, and I believe that's from Patrick, yes, and um, so, so can you make me a co-host for a second uh, to just share the relevant articles uh, so that we are sure what we're talking about? Uh, am I a co-host? Yeah. Just a moment. So I only have the option of making you host. So yeah, anyway. Are you done? Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm now a co-host. Okay, so let me share this. Let me hide everything behind this one first before I share my screen with you guys. Just a second. 
that one here. Awesome. So, so that's a very interesting uh, question you've asked, and I think I noted it here. How do we address the problematic aspects of the FCFTA, such as Articles 18 and 19 dealing with uh, continental preferences and place of RECs, given the lethargy of the RECs um, have generally in guaranteeing amb ambitious integration. So this is it, right? So this is critical for us to look at it. I don't want to assume that you guys have, have dealt with these on your day-to-day -day basis. So let's look at those for a quick, uh, before analyzing it. Following the entry into force of the H agreement, which is now in force, the state parties shall, when implementing this agreement, accord each other on reciprocal basis preferences that are no less favorable than those given to third parties. Fine. Uh, that, that's something you see in a lot of trade agreements. A state party shall afford opportunity to the other state parties to negotiate preferences granted to third parties prior to entry into force of this agreement, such as preferences, shall be, ex shall be on a reciprocal basis. In the case where a state party is interested in preferences in the paragraph, the state party shall afford opportunity to other state parties, a mouthful, to negotiate on a reciprocal basis, taking into account levels of development of the states. This agreement shall not nullify, modify, or revoke rights and obligations under pre-existing trade agreements uh, that state parties have. I'll come back to that. Article 19, 19, conflict and inconsistency with regional agreements. In the event of any conflict and inconsistency between this agreement and any regional agreement, this agreement shall prevail to the extent of the specific inconsistency otherwise, except as otherwise provided in this agreement. This is also normal, right? Uh, in, in your interpretation of agreement, you don't pick the general over the specific. The specific uh, will override the general. Notwithstanding the provisions though, of paragraph one, state parties that are members of other regional economic communities and RTAs and customs unions, which have attained among themselves higher levels of regional integration than under this agreement shall maintain uh, a high, such higher levels amongst themselves. This is the point, so let me start from the back uh, to the front here. This is the point I made when I said that in thinking about these agreements, uh, you have to think about the fact that the RT, the regional economic communities are critical, right, to the AFCFTA's implementation. Uh, in what world can you imagine that as of today, the AFCFTA is already ahead of any of these regional economic communities? That is not true. Right? So the regional economic communities have advanced in the ways they have thought about economic integration. But what do we know about what they've done? It is that they have struggled in the core aspect of trade. They have not failed. I don't think they have failed. In my own forthcoming book and my other work, you will see I've argued against the failure narrative. So I don't believe African regional trade agreements have failed. They have struggled in their trade uh, intra-trade relationships. And that's because of the historical way the states are constituted. If you have states that are fundamentally similar in what they produce, if you have states uh, that are unequally yoked in the way they're cooperating, then it means there's just so only so much they can do with each other, right? So they don't fit what we understand. However, to come back uh, to Patrick's interesting question, to say, how do we address the problem that arises out of this particular two provisions my take is this, and it connects to the argument I've made uh, 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 with, with the Pan-African thinking that we need, first of all, to, be, to have a shared idea uh, of what we mean uh, for trade liberalization, integration, and development of the African continent. Uh, I don't think we have that yet in the critical mass of African leaders. Uh, I think we see pockets that are celebrated from time to time of leaders that drive the continent forward based on visions of their states. And I don't need to mention names, but you can look at it and think about which states you think you've heard of in recent times that look like the head of state is really driving a national, but also continental ambition, as opposed to one that looks like they say one thing today and they do something else tomorrow. Right? In fact, as they're saying one thing today, they're already signing an agreement that moves away from it. So on the one hand, you can think about this as saying, okay, we need this shared vision, not one that collapses the interests of the states uh, into a supranational organization. I'm also a bit 
careful about what that means, right? And so I don't see the role of law here uh, as the only thing by which this solution can be reached. Uh, because law remains law if you don't put the political interest to match it for its implementation. So I think we need to address the theme before the law, which is a shared vision of what the developmental interest will be on the one hand. But on the other hand, is to also look at the fact that how can we enhance the cost of regional in integration on the continent once we're looking at the roles of the regional economic schemes? We need to go back to the fundamentals and we need to seriously think about how we imagine this existing African continent, African regional trade agreement working. So you think about the ECOWAS, for example, its liberalization agenda started in the 80s, 83, 84, 85. But where are we today? You can ask yourself, it's predicated on notions of neoliberal thinking. You can make arguments about the fact that the economic ideology orthodoxies on which these agreements are based are fundamentally different from what the continent needs. I agree with you. And that's part of the shared vision. I think we need to sit down and talk about. James Githy has written about the neoliberal turn in trade agreements. All these are fundamental to a structure that we need to rethink instead of codifying inequities, codifying divisions and codifying ideas, the implementation of, implementation of which will really tear us apart as a nation. So that's my take to that. I mean, a lot of these things at the end of the day, one has to be careful, are uh, really hinged about political uh, interest at the end of the day. So my argument does not uh, ignore the fact that at the end of the day, uh, states have a room to do what they want. Uh, and that it, it's not one that is blind to the realities of how this game uh, gets played. But at, but at its heart is that until we have such a vision uh, that drives the continent, the majority of the continent, to take measures that lock out externalities, that lock out divisions from within, that punish, in my view, those kind of moves uh, by way of you know, trade uh, uh, measures, uh, restrictions, I don't think we'll see, we'll see the progress we want. I think states will continue to assert their sovereignty, notion which is itself contended uh, you know, in the scholarship uh, to really just take the continent in whichever way they want. So it's not doom here, uh, but I think there's a lot more soul searching that has to be done beyond the celebratory nature uh, that we take these agreements uh, for. Okay, I, I don't know if I took a lot of time on that, Patrick. I don't know if I addressed everything, but that's, that's my take on it. Okay then. Um, so, of course, next we will go to the rest of the questions. Um, so first is, according to order of people who raised their hand, is Butera. And second would be Islam, who has typed his question on the chat. Third would therefore be Halil. Um, followed by Nelson Utino, and then finally, so far, um, so far is Aaron Onyango's question. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very, very great uh, presentation from Prof, and uh, I learned a lot uh, very, very much and read his paper. So my, my questions are, is about just where he ended. Very, very interesting thread that I think, you know, he can expound on it answering my question. So my question is regards to time. What makes or what made the drafters of this FTA think that it's the right time for, for this? Because there are very many, uh, very many issues with, uh, you know, the way just Prof went about it and they really, you know, highlighted most of the issues that I thought about it. So there's this big brother imperialism, this internal imperialism that seems to be emerging already as we just thoughtfully as people are thinking, as the, you know, the codification of inequalities you, you talked about, you know, the, you know, the structures that are, are inherently deep rooted, you know, in our countries, you've got Nigeria versus uh, uh, Rwanda. So recently last year, Kenya was presenting almost the whole budget of the rest of East African countries. Now I'm trying to think of uh, this FCFTA seem not to codify uh, ideologies and perceptions and visions. Even if we went with the idea of Prof. what presented some sort of like a unified vision 
a unified vision we want um, you know eliminate disparities eliminate inequality so just to go straight to my point is that there's different ideologies and approaches on how people especially countries are thinking about this and when we talk about time we've got countries most that have people who are sellers you know the business the middle class or rather the the bourgeoisie comprando who are just brokers so they they, they buy things from china and the us and the rest of uh, countries and resell them as materials just as people sell watches and the rest and now you want to create an instrument that enables trade but trade of what there's most of african countries they're simply unproductive units which are trading nothing apart from you know imports they got outside we already think about uh, trying to help these people share what they have what they are brokering you know what they are selling on behalf of the masters so and when you talk about ideology itself i think there's a problem in terms of how we are approaching rebellization itself you've got a country where i come from tanzania where we are so protectionist in a sense that we think that when we further some nationalistic agenda some nationalism that, that we think that that's that's more so the approach for example from nerele was that we've got bottom to top unification and ghana with with inquiry thought of top to bottom unification and that's still i think it's still pushing it's a push but still there so recently before magufuli passed on you could see when you track his his ideas and how he went about east african union itself he was so uh, a rejection is to so protection i'm trying to think of uh, as much as we have an instrument that we are all talking about what's the perfect time we have have we studied each countries and uh, understood each other because i think we need to create internal independence first with tanzania as a unit and rwanda as a unit and this independence creates voluntary relation that seems to be uh on equal footing so uh, wh why do you place that timing the growth that we didn't put into consideration at what rate would we sit and say at least on the level of inequalities there's, there's a bit of you know uh, uh level ground so i just want to talk about that timing and what you think of time okay okay uh, so joy do you want me to just go and then i'll just respond to the ones that are written in the order you had laid out uh yes um probably just to point out Arnold, i forgot this to mention but Arnold has mentioned has requested that you place him back at as the host so that he can continue his administrative duties oh okay yeah uh, would that be dr hill that would do that yeah probably so um we'll just continue however for the ones okay. who have raised who have raised the um, questions on the chat I shall probably read them out because Islam, who's the next one, has raised his question, his concerns on the chat. Yeah, and I can his see that for you. Yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you can see it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I sure. Can Just yeah. you can okay. take over then. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Buthera. Now you, I'm this sorry, is bro. what as you go on, please make me host. You are still the host. Oh uh, uh, am I? Okay. Let me just turn that over quickly. Uh are no it's a go okay uh, you keep going just a second please so blame me for this when i ask to be made uh okay make a host great okay that should be solved. All right. So, so Bethera, this is uh, keeping in line with uh, with this group of students uh, who are really brilliant. You've asked a very difficult question, um, and so I should preface my reflection with the fact that um, I, I'm not suggesting a, a solution uh, to it all. Right. Um, so, I think I should start by saying I don't think there's re with respect to time. I don't think there's a there's such a thing as this is the time to make this move uh, to address what I call transcending uh, in internal inequalities, right? Um, the place to start is to say, look, a lot of the very notions and ideas we critique 
about the relationship between the global North and the global South countries are reproduced on the continent. I don't think we argue about that, right? Uh, we see same type of uh, disciplinary interaction uh, between, for example, the UK and, and, and Kenya, right? Uh, my adopted country, by the way, uh, manifesting in how Kenya reacts to Rwandans, right? Uh, so you do see them, for example, in the vaccine context, they say, don't come into, you know, you can't travel, Kenyans can't come unless they satisfy this, right? You may see some African countries doing the same uh, to fellow countries. So there's a reproduction uh, of those binaries in there. That's one. Number two is one that is, I put, and scholars have done this, lay the blame solely at the feet of, of the global North countries, especially the colonizers, in that the creation of many states in Africa is really a problematic one, and I've alluded to it. These states are shells. They have nothing to live on. We're thinking here about why did the inequalities come to be? We have to acknowledge those to be able to then go into how we might address or transcend them. Now, post-colonialism, many of those states haven't also done more beyond AIDS as the basis for development, right? Uh, where opportunities have arisen for tax to be used as a mean of means of development, corruption has re-edited uh, in situations where you've seen uh, uh, industries, extractive industries thrive, and in years where there has been boom, uh, national airlines have squandered uh, those monies. Illicit financial flow has characterized the way the operation of transnational corporations operated on the continent. So appreciating and transcending uh, internal inequalities be between and among African countries is a complex thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's not one thing one can suggest that this is the time to do it or this is the way to do it. In my view, many pieces of the puzzle need to run simultaneously. So what does that look like by way of example? Infrastructure is critical. In the next chapter of the article I'm writing, I take on the notion of infrastructure. The infrastructure we have on the continent still reinforces colonial pathologies, colonial ways of doing and living and being. Since when have you seen a construction of new roads well, you see a little bit of development corridors today, but how up to the recent flurry, which has really stopped, when have you seen new routes constructed from spots of exploration, taking them through the state within Nigeria, for example, through to Ghana, through to Ivory Coast, through to Benin, through to Togo, right? How about the air transportation? What are we doing to ease that burden of traveling within the continent. Until recently, you had to go to France to go to Benin, that is so close to Nigeria, right? So transcending these ideas is not a question of time. The documents are there, yet contending visions of Pan-Africanism in my own view really make mockery of them. We have protocols on the SATM, right? We have a lot of these ideas there. So I don't have what is the, time bomb, right, that really will change these things. Except that which, with each ideas that are put on the table, uh, we have to think about how does this particular project enhance, and be careful, I'm not saying all, the majority of the developmental aspirations of African countries. Because it is difficult to pull everybody together to go, right? Which is why the innovations that you see in the variable geometry provisions of the FCFTA really is one that we appreciate, or at least I appreciate, right? So, so again, you, you've asked a difficult question, and I just think that, uh, you know, infrastructure, we need to be more intentional about how do the design of our roads enhance trade, right? You think about the Maputo corridor, you think about the one that goes from South Africa to Mozambique, right, down, and what does that do to the cost of trading between those countries? Right? How does it reorient our thinking about inter, inter, inter uh, uh, linkages between these states, as opposed to those that really just carry products 
from where they are explored to the ports and outside of the continent. That hasn't happened a lot, right? So, so that's one area I think I can put thoughts on it. One can talk about policies, uh, and I don't think that African states lack good policies. To be honest with you, I can speak about Nigerian context. It's really about implementation of that. Uh, ethnicity, ethnicity is a problem. Uh, I don't know how much that plays out in other parts of the continent, uh, but from the works of political scientists that I've read, that maps out a lot uh, as well uh, for what we think about national development uh, and how we think about a shared vision. We don't think in statist contexts. We, we, we still don't think as nations, some people are invested in the idea of a Nigeria, the idea of a Ghana, the idea of an Ivory Coast. Well, you know, what, what does it mean to you as a Nigerian, as a Kenyan, to see this country thrive? We, what are those ideas, right? Foundational, let's leave the failures of the past that brought these states to be on the side for a second and think about this group of scholars. How do you see these nations moving forward? I think those are part of the ideas that we need and hopefully the important work you're doing here really galvanizes to see that the agenda we need to build for, the, for transcending these internal squabbles and inequalities are those that we have to develop uh, for ourselves and hopefully be at the forefront of implementing for ourselves. So it, it sounds all over the place, Butera, but, but it's such is the nature of the question you ask. It's not one that has a silver bullet uh, that really addresses it. Okay, so uh, let me now go to the questions here. Wow, many of them. Okay, so uh, Rizwano, thank you for your question. Uh, while this was not the focus of uh, his presentation, I wonder if BC could share his thoughts on if it is just a myth or reality that African countries do not want a formal legalized dispute settlement regime. Oh, very interesting question there. Uh, so, so first of all, I think the idea that it is a myth uh, that African states, uh, uh, you know, uh, are skeptical of formal regimes of dispute settlement is untrue. It's simply untrue. I mean, we were all treated about a month ago now to the ICJ treatment, right, of, uh, of Kenya and then Somalia. Then you had previous kinds of disputes uh, that have been taken to the ICJ, Nigeria, Cameroon. Uh, you have others that have happened not as much uh, on the WTO scene, uh, but we have the one that, that was nearing uh, a real constitution of the panel uh, recently. So I think we acknowledge these, and I mean, in the national context, we use these. You look at what uh, the, the recent book by, by Professor Gathi, which, which a, lot of, a lot of folks contributed to, really have talked about how you know, states are, are dragged before regional courts. So I think we have an appreciable level uh, as African states for formal dispute settlement, right? Uh, I think where the challenge lies is that, and this is my view, African states also acknowledge that in the international economic law context, uh, dragging them before the systems that exist uh, really puts them at a very disadvantageous position. Uh, if you look at that and contrast it with the international investment law regime, uh, you'll see my point that the international investment law regime, for example, states consistently get dragged there, damages slammed on them, and unfortunately they bear the brunt of that in the ISDS system. So the formal thing is not the problem. It is what does it do to them, right? And I think in the context of the uh, AFCFTA, uh, excuse me, regional economic regimes in Africa, we have to appreciate the diplomacy with which African states have chosen uh, to do uh, what they do in terms of dispute settlement. Uh, it is one which I think the, the WTO and its regime have so quickly forgotten as a key aspect of the regime they have. Perhaps because the big nations today drive a lot of those, uh, drive a lot of those dispute settlements, we tend to think uh, that the most appropriate means of settling disputes is to end up in those core uh, traditional adversarial model uh, where we are there. And I think no African states have this important thing to contribute uh, to the other regimes. Uh, there are books coming out, uh, and I think one is one of the one that won the CL. Uh, prize for international economic law, most recently that discusses the contribution 
uh, that African trade regimes can make uh, to the understanding of the WTO system. So MD Rizwan, uh, to answer the question pointedly, uh, no, African states uh, are not opposed to legalized formal trade regimes. I think they are very systematic in how they engage with it. I would argue uh, one that I think on the spot is another example of my claim for contending visions of Pan-Africanism in the dispute settlement and how they choose uh, what works for them and what does not work for them. Uh, that argument is not the first time it has been made. Professor Gathia, I think I remember in his book, talks about uh, how African states choose uh, based on developmental aspirations as well. In that context, something like that was made uh, by way of argument. And so uh, um, we'll see where the AFCFTA goes uh, in terms of the investment protocol uh, that is being drafted and how its own settlement system uh, works at the end of the day. Oh, oh. There are some questions that came after Islam that were raised. Um, the worries people had raised hands in the session. So, so far, as at this point, please note your number. So from now on, the first one will be Khalil. And the second one, after Khalil, will be Nelson Ocheno. Then afterwards, Aaron Onyango, which is number, th number three. Then after that, we shall have Kiai. And then Louis Gitinua, Ali Abdi, Ali and Brenda, and then finally Sydney so far. Um, of note is that for Nelson and Lewis, their questions are in the charts. So the rest of, um, for the rest of your, if for, for the rest of you guys, if I call, if your name, if, if it's your turn, please do speak up. Uh, so thank you, Joy. Kalia. Exactly. Thanks, Kali. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so my question is from a point of ignorance, but I suppose uh, that's okay. <laughs> For this forum. Um, so when you say there are competing, competing visions of Pan-Africanism, and I'm thinking of Pan-Africanism as an idea, then the, these countries have, um, um, let's say, versions of this idea based on their partisan national interests. Um, are there any central attributes um, that are implied in these competing versions that we can speak of um, as, you know, let's develop these ones as um, part of a common vision, or are there even any places where these central attributes are expressed, like explicitly? Then secondly, which I don't know if this is taking you slightly beyond the scope of your lecture, but um, in your article, you speak of patterns of inequality since you know colonialism, post-colonialism that are very much entrenched in this international economic order. Um, now I want to um, touch on a specific um, area of investment um, and um, so there's been there's been talk of the Pan-African Investment Code uh, being the basis of the investment protocol for the um, free trade area and um, like authors such as yourself in other writing have emphasized the Africanization of investment law and whether um, those reforms are either moderate or radical enough to um, sort of challenge these patterns of inequality and to affect this unequal architecture. In your view, does the adoption of the PAIC, the Pan-African Investment Code, uh, in this free area um, represent uh, one such move towards that radical change or is it just another moderate uh, reform that doesn't do much for us in the wider architecture of investment law and uh, international economic law? Thank you. Thanks a lot, um, Khalil. Uh, brilliant questions um, that you've asked. So on the first one, uh, you know, instances of, uh, of if, let's reward it differently. What are the features, right, that have been des demonstrated that show Pan-Africanism as, um, as a non-contending uh, idea, right, if I could rephrase, rephrase it in those, in those terms. Of course, you think about the, the decolonization movement, right? Those were times when African leaders, right, Kwame Nkrumah, uh, 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 a lot of them are the forefront of, of those ideas, marshaled interests, right, about the African continent. And in fact, they had shared visions, aspirations of an African uh, unity uh, that, that uh, united 
nations within Africa, let's put it that way, I, the, the specific uh, three words escape my mind now, but that's an example, right? The decolonization movement. Uh, you think about the movement, uh, again, in the 1970s, the new international economic order uh, to restructure uh, the international economic order uh, via the General Assembly of the United Nations when the majority of uh, former colonized regions under the species of uh, uh, of the third world uh, group, uh, you know, moved by the strength of their numbers, even though it didn't succeed a lot, uh, to change the structure, right? Uh, an example of what the African nations did in coming together there uh, is, is an instance of African states coming together politically, right, uh, to, to move forward. You see, this is where it is interesting. Once it comes to political agendas, I don't think it has been difficult for the continent to come together in solidarity to make this kind of united front sing, right? So there's political will that has gone into the completion of the EFCFTA in its signing, right? There's political will that has gone into uh, let's, let's ratify as quickly as possible. But once it gets to the real game, to the nitty gritty, there's problems. So in the economic context, this is where the contentions play out, right? And you can't separate, of course, the economic from the political uh, and vice versa. And so this is where it gets really interesting. I mean, think about the new uh, economic uh, partnership uh, development uh, agenda, the NEPAT that we had years ago. What became of it, right? Uh, uh, Professor Grassi, I'm sure some of you have written it, read, wrote about that, where he did a critical appeal of that particular agreement uh, and the idea that this does not mirror a lot of the uh, developmental trajectory that African states need to be on, right? So, so when it comes to uh, celebrating what IR scholars have described as uh, uh, a symbolic, and I use this there, or celebratory signing of this kind of agreement, you see a version of Pan-Africanism because it's just okay. But once we leave those tables, uh, and we come to with what does it mean for the cement industry in Nigeria? What does it mean for rice production in Nigeria? What does it mean for the sale of cotton uh, between, then you see the different versions playing out in that context. So, th so that I think is some examples I can put out there. Your second question is a very interesting one. As you said, uh, folks here may, may not have seen it. I can put, put the link in the, in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, but, but this goes to another paper I've done, which is on the notion of Africanization and international investment law. I think it's important to be clear. In the piece, if you've not written it, I am not saying that there is actually uh, an Africanization idea that drives everything. What you will see I tried to do in that piece was to engage with the existing body of work to suggest how we might think of Africanization. Uh, and for me, I conceptualize it, as you rightly said, Khalil, on a broad spectrum, that it is not one thing. And that once we talk about reforms and engagement with the international investment system, uh, it's on a spectrum. You can think about procedural, you can think about the substantive, uh, but wherever they land on the spectrum, uh, I call, you know, as moderate, uh, and you can see it as radical now. Some folks have argued for a radical change. Uh, Harrison, or is Harrison, I think, uh, he, um, uh, yeah, he, maybe more than anyone else in that block symposium we did on Afronomics Law, called for this, right, and says, you know, everything else you guys are doing at the Oxytral and this window dressing, as he says, uh, doesn't move uh, anything forward. You're just rearranging the chairs within the room. That's interesting. But rearranging the chairs within the room is an important thing when you are fighting against a system that remains significantly more powerful than you are. Do you imagine that there's a world in which the developed states will hand over for developing countries to take over the system? I, I don't think so. So I think that we have to be very strategic. And in that piece, what I did was to say, look, uh, look at PIKE, the Pan-African Investment Code, which, which is now, as I understand, informing in part the negotiation of the, of the investment uh, uh, protocol of the FCFTA. It has introduced a lot of features that centers Africans' interests, right? Uh, and to the extent that this is something that has been celebrated and in fact incorporates notions that are not ideas, that are not found in the North-South traditional agreement, 
And then it moves us forward. It is not where we want to be. It is still moderate. It's not where we want to be, but it moves us along on the spectrum. And what I call for is more of those incremental piecemeal moves because engaging with those will give you over a period of time an aggregate of concrete reforms that may have subverted the regime uh, that we are trying to fight against without fundamentally calling it radical, right? So Khalil, Pike is moderate in my view. Uh, we hope uh, that the, the AFCFTA investment protocol uh, will move us forward in another direction uh, as well, okay? Thanks. Nelson Agatha is next. Is this question here? Yes, it's in the chat. Um, okay. I can read it for you. Okay. Oh, thanks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he says, thanks professor for the presentation. There is, in, there is an emerging inward looking economic development policy in Kenya called Buy Kenya, Build Kenya. The same is replicated in other states. It promotes procurement of local state content, among others. What is your opinion on the impact on the trend of tr on trade liberalization goals on the AFCFTA? Okay, thanks a lot, um, Nelson. Uh, so, so the, I mean, this is also learning. I, I didn't know of buy Kenya, build Kenya. Uh, so this is an interesting uh, thing uh, that I think is being done here uh, by the government. Uh, you say it's replicated in other states, promotes procurement of local states. This is the beginning, right? In terms, in terms of the actual operationalization of the idea uh, of, of how you think about uh, development that centers African interests, this is an instantiation of it, right? That we buy produce uh, from our companies because we empower them uh, to expand uh, and we don't look out to, to just buy things that are from the Tommy Hill figures and from, you know, uh, from the other known chains around the world, right? So uh, you guys are on the other side. I'm on this side today and I'm flying the African attire today, for example. Uh, so you might say maybe I've bought uh, Nigerian, I've bought Kenyan, uh, but, but this can easily also be a very popular thing that governments do, uh, right? Uh, you have to be very skeptical here of a populist agenda uh, that really just says buy Nigerian, buy uh, this, when that product itself uh, doesn't really stand to compete with others that are imported. Uh, so this particular one around your question of, you know, my opinion on the impact of the trend on trade liberalization on goals, uh, goals of EFCFTA, it has potential, right? It has promises. Uh, we have done things on the continent that are strong. Uh, we have products uh, that make their way out of the continent uh, that are very good, uh, that we sell within the continent too. Uh, I can use the example of tomato paste. Um, I can use quite weirdly toothpick that comes to Nigeria from Kenya. Uh, you know, maybe they come with other parts now, right? So there are products that are made that, that, that are good uh, and that are sold within uh, and among African states. And I think that's an example of how we can think about developmental interests uh, 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 really permeating down uh, from the production of those items to the consumption of those arguments, of those products. Let me contrast it and show its importance. One of the critical things that political scientists, and I think Franco, Franco Bayard was the one who made this argument, he talks about the politi uh, uh, politics of the belly. And they talk about the but the propensity of Africans uh, and their politicians to, to consume expensive products, uh, right? So these are ideas that are not uh, free of nuances around colonial thinking, uh, if you ask me as well. The idea that, for example, we must go to court in, in wigs and gown. Why does that have to be, right? Uh, the idea that we must wear suits to court. Uh, what does that do uh, for you? Uh, the idea that you don't think you have very good tailors Therefore, on the continent or in Kenya or in Nigeria, that's so suit that fits you very well. So what, where does it lead you to, right? To buy those that are imported at the end of the day. So you can think about this in another way, right? And say, what, what does this subvert, right? What does it aim to do? It aims to subvert the dominance of the Western market. But that, with that has to come an appreciation of what it does over time 
for the development of the country. And that's where there's an important civil society campaign, citizen focused orientation of what this does for, for our economies. Okay. All right. Uh, is, uh, who is next? Aaron, his question is, of course, in real time. So okay. he can speak up. I believe I was next. Well, uh, first and foremost, thank you for the presentation. And uh, however, personally, not to be a wet blanket, I do believe that in some sense, um, the treaty in itself is, or the idea of the trade area is actually a pipe dream when you come to think of it. We do have the likes of the Malabo Protocol, even down to the regional instruments, like the ESC agreements and the likes that are yet to be, yet to be actually realized. And uh, I believe that the adoption of uh, the African trade area is to help us keep up with, uh, help us uh, develop a certain framework in which we Seems we lost him. We are able to develop in an Afrocentric manner. I think that this model is this trade area. I'm here. Uh, I hope you can hear me. Yes. Okay. Can uh, this the speaker hear me? Do you mind typing your question? Maybe. Okay. 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 So Joy, who's next? Okay, so afterwards we can go to Kiai, who is in real time again, so he can speak. Uh, professor, uh, professor, this is, um, I think this, uh, this lecture has really uh, stimulated my mind and it's uh, gotten me thinking about um, a certain theme and that theme is uh, the competing interests of African countries versus uh, a common uh, vision for Africa. And we've taken the plunge and we've tried to define what um, Pan-Africanism is. After taking this plunge, could we, because I think um, a problem has been that African countries are also pursuing different interests at the same time and sort of um, abusing their sovereignty to undermine the, the AFC FTA. So, could a solution lie in supranationality such that um, once we have this uh, concrete uh, common vision of Pan-Africanism, uh, our countries can cede some of their sovereignty such that there can be limits on what actions they can take in, in terms of trading with third countries, uh, such that if these actions are contrary or they undermine the FCFTA, they can be prevented from taking these actions and it could sort of um, it could sort of speed up the process of um, increasing trade among African countries as opposed to trade between African countries and their colonial masters. Well, thanks, uh, Ki. It's 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 a very good question again uh, from you. And and what I take from that is the key is is the potential for supranational. Um, uh, organization, uh, a supranationally inclined uh, decision-making process and empowering it. I, I'm skeptical of what that can do on the African continent in my own uh, research, to be honest with you. Um, let me use the ECOWAS context on which my forthcoming book is on. And so part of that process when I wrote my doctoral thesis was to look at the report of the Committee of Eminent Persons uh, that drafted the uh, revised ECOWAS treaty. And it was clear that they, it was led by, by Nigeria president, former Nigerian president Gowon, Yakubu Gowon. And one of the ideas they really pushed for was, you know, supranational organization. Uh, let's change ECOWAS. Let's make every, you know, country see the certain level of uh, power over which decision will be binding and for which you must uh, comply with it. Now, uh, do we have a, a particular type of supranational thinking at work in African economic organizations already? Sure. You have to ask yourself, what do the courts do, right? The, the courts are there. Their decisions are not just given. States appear before them, right? 
Uh, but there's also how we have to think about uh, how that challenges ideas of what we understand of compliance, effectiveness, and complying with those decisions. We put that in another bucket. But we can use that to inform a thinking about whether what we really need, as you've asked, is another notion of supranational case where states see power over national economic policy issues uh, to its regional government. The EU do not do all of that too well either, if you ask me, right? I mean, look at Brexit episode that we've had, even within the context of the EU, it's not as if we have that united front around its operationalization. So I think where there is scope is to reimagine such organizations as the parliament of the regional organizations, right? Right now, we don't see what they do. Their role is not clear in this matrix that we have. And I think there's opportunities there, to be honest with you, uh, to grow uh, the, the trajectory of, of economic integration uh, on the continent. Um, I think history, maybe at least over 50% shows that, you know, African states and leaders are not so enthusiastic uh, about saying decisions will be made by some organizations from, you know, Ethiopia uh, over them. Uh, and that you can understand when you think about who finances those organizations. The ideas that those organizations propound, where do they come from, right? At the end of the day, we might throw ourselves up for another colonization, not that the colonization ended, you know, but we might see a different type just playing out. And so this notion of supranationality, I, I appreciate its value. Uh, I appreciate its, its, um, its, its role in the context of international understanding or economic integration, but I'm skeptical about its value. Uh, for the type of understanding we have in Africa. I mean, why, why did Professor Gaffi argue about flexibility of regional trade agreements, for example, right? I used to show the various ways that we also think about this. Uh, and I, I disagree with respect on some aspects of his argument, but I see the big picture of that claim. And it is part of what your question really speaks to, simply giving a supranational nature or uh, thinking to, to any of these organizations may not really change anything beyond meaningful engagement that centers interests that drives key beyond the political will uh, understanding of a shared vision that will be implemented to the core. How that looks like, I, I don't think I'm able to say specifically, but I'm skeptical of just thinking that supranationality does it. I know Professor Faiba Iboa makes argument like this as well, uh, but it is one I respectfully, <laughs> respectfully disagree with uh, uh, on these issues. Thanks. The next comes from Louis Gitinio. I can read it for you if okay. you wish. Uh, let me just get it out so that I, I don't have to do all this work. Uh, just a second, I should get there. Ah, uh, okay, Luis, good. Okay, so thank you, BC, for your, okay. Uh, my question, how can we make the AFCFT operational when the sensitive issue regarding the rules of origin is still being negotiated? <laughs> and as you may be aware, this is a key contentious point for big African countries, for instance. You are right, uh, and I think that, you know, shows in part the challenges um, that we face once we get to the nuts and bolts of how to make this work on the continent, uh, that the real economic interests are ahead. Uh, and that this is really, this really uh, nego negotiating stance of nations in these rules of very origin context telegraphs interests of their national allies, right? And that is something you don't see a lot in trying to tie the connection. Right? How do Kenyan national elites, you know, uh, uh, in the language of the West, lobby the state, right, and its apparatus to put certain interests forward and do not put certain interests forward? That is contentious because there's also contending national interests about which one should be in place, right? So, so you're right, and, and I think it's, it's, it's complex. Uh, it's complex not just for Africa, it's complex for how uh, 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 we think about the EU. I know the UK, uh, Kenya, uh, FTA has the, the, the rules of origin thing attached to it. And next, you know, I don't have understanding about how that negotiation happened, uh, but this is not something easy. 
uh, to address at all. Uh, and so I think it mimics part of the contention uh, that I talk about in this, uh, in this paper. Thanks. Okay then, um, it was meant to be Ali, but he's just communicated that his question has already been asked. And therefore we shall move to Brenda, whose question is also in the chat. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Uh, so Brenda now, oh, thanks, Brenda. She says, uh, to what extent do you think that Pan-Africanism also serves as a legitimating tool for an otherwise contentious political project? Awesome. So that's the first part. Let me take that. Now, in the chapter that I uploaded, that particular section comes towards the end. Uh, in the aspect that I'm developing further, this is one of the art things that it does, right? That different versions of Pan-Africanism really have different effects. So let me give an example of the one that legitimates tools of, of, of the West, for example. Look at the EPAs, right? Why has the least developed countries, in most cases, gone ahead or gone alone to sign the agreement? Because they think it's, it, it enhances their interests. Now, that, to some extent, legitimizes a narrative that African states as a whole have moved against in terms of the post-colonial uh, post continuities, right, of the EPA and its architecture, right? So I agree with you that uh, Pan-Africanism, beyond being this ideal that we fetishize, that we appreciate for many things it does, is problematic right now uh, for us. I mean, you can put why, what Kenya has done with, with the UK in that bucket as well. What does it mean for, 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 the, for the region? What does it mean for the continent? What does it mean for the FCFTA? Uh, you have rendered it in the language of legitimizing tool for an otherwise contentious political project. Um, I see it, I, I agree with you, but like I said, I think it also significantly legitimizes and simultaneously delegitimizes uh, political projects within the continent, developmental projects within the continent like the FCFTA over time. Uh, uh, number two is, could you say more about the debates around technocracy versus democracy? Is the FCFTA perhaps narrowing the space for contestation over the kind of African we want by framing the integration project in technical legal terms? So let me start from the second. Um, I don't have insight into how all the negotiation happened, right? Uh, but I think that we have to start somewhere. Uh, so I think it is difficult to imagine that we'll have an agreement that addresses uh, most or the majority of all our challenges. Uh, we may never get there. So I appreciate that on the one hand. But there's also a sense that the uh, EP, that the AFCFTA itself was rushed. Uh, much like you see uh, the US Kenya FTA almost being rushed down the throat of Kenyan uh, government, uh, and you see the UK. Uh, Kenya one rushed down uh, <laughs> the continent. There's something about that that happens. So I think in the AFCFTA context, um, I don't think it undermines the Africa we want. I think it serves as the beginning of more meaningful conversation. Uh, and I hoped that it was less celebrated as the big thing that we were already expecting because it hasn't really done anything. I mean, look at trading right now. Uh, not much has happened since July 1st for, for really understandable reasons, except that we are now pitching ourselves against what looks like institutionalist ideas about uh, selling this agreement uh, beyond what it is. So I think we need to be careful, uh, both as scholars in our assessment of this agreement for what it is, uh, but also those who do the important work behind the, behind the, the curtains, uh, you know, in negotiating, uh, to see this as a journey right, towards, towards an end on which we will get to milestones that are critical uh, in years uh, to come. Uh, what does it do in terms of technocracy versus democracy? I'm not sure about the technocracy one. If you want to just quickly speak to that to just help me. So I was, uh, thanks, thanks for the response. I was also just thinking about the comment that you made about rules of origin and how even you might not have expertise. I, am not, I don't have any expertise on trade. And as somebody who's looking at it from outside, that there is this way in which the, the very technical language around trade is kind of exclusionary. And so you have these discussions that are happening at the AU level with various committees, technical groups, 
But civil society, for example, was almost completely excluded from the process. And now you have an agreement that has been framed as it's legal, it's technical, but at the same time, it has an impact, as you said, on distribution, on, on uh, inequality, on all of this. So that just this kind of narrow focus of a small group of technocrats um, who are then dealing with issues, dealing with political questions, if that yeah. makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. And so, so I think, what, you know what I'll say, Brenda, is it's, it's such an important thing. And this is where I think we need to acknowledge the, the age we are in the trajectory of international economic law in Africa. The EU did not become what it is today, you see? Uh, a post-World War II uh, adventure is what is celebrated today, uh, questionably, as we all understand, as the, as the go-to in, in the gold standard of economic integration, right? Uh, that's not true. Uh, but we also have to look at ourselves and say, we are probably only just getting meaningful engagement on the trade umbrella, maybe in the past 15 years, if you ask me, right? Our courts are now just getting meaningful trade integration. Harris and Boris chapter uh, article in the, in the African Journal of International Economic Law discusses those. Uh, there's a book on that, uh, on the Ohada context, written by other scholars. Now we are seeing what this is. All these are going to give us an idea of what it means. But you know what is also interesting, and, and this is a different way of answering this question, um, I have to say this, one of the things we do on Afronomics Law is the Indaba, uh, which is important conversation. And what it is geared at doing, and I think they, 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 I remember this from one of our conversations as the editors, is to bring people who are often behind the scene to chat with us about what they do. I, I think, Brenda, there's room to, uh, to just make this open if we know of people who are skilled like this, mostly economists. I, I don't know that the lawyers are the ones who do that job, to be honest. Uh, you know, economists to speak to us in terms that we understand, uh, it will be helpful, right? Uh, we don't critique for the sake of critiquing. Uh, we, we want to critique from a point of knowledge. Uh, and so one has to, to also acknowledge that there's a bit of education that one continues to do. I continue to do it. The most interesting analysis I've heard on rules of origin was from watching an interview that was shared with me by Professor Gathi. I'll be I'm honest with you. And that was on a TV in Ghana, right? So guys, all these wounds we found on the pages of the articles and those newspapers alone that we read. We, we have to see what is happening on the continent. And there has been over time, a desire to just look to the West for knowledge, to even on even matters of rules of origin. And so, so you asked a very important question, Brenda, and I'm not sure it is one that I'm attempting to answer as to saying it is also a challenge to me uh, and to us all that acknowledging the age we are means there's, in, there's opportunity to, better, to develop expertise, right? On, on such technical areas as rules of origin uh, and all these negotiation metrics and what goes on to them. Let me give the final response and then I'll move to that. Yesterday in, in my, one of the classes I teach, I had uh, Dr. Joy Katagekwa. And what she said was that she started her career from working uh, as a negotiator for the government of Uganda. Guys, I wish I knew that many years ago. I said it at the beginning of my class. I didn't take international trade law class. It's self-taught, right? So I didn't have the skills to even get to try to work in the government office. The Nigerian government didn't even have a trade negotiation office when I was in law school, right? It's a recent thing they did. Now, but I've seen folks who are now in those offices go to WTO and come back. And since we're in an academic forum, there's a huge opportunity difference. Please don't look to the WTO as a place to start alone. I know there are interests to dream big, but you may be better off getting your hands dirty in the ministry, a little bit in the ministry in Kenya, in Nigeria, in Rwanda, in Burundi, understanding what it means to really negotiate these things, then pivot from that point to grow. That's a challenge to myself as much as it is to you for me to learn relative to where I am. 
Thanks, Brenda, for the question. Next, we have Sydney, um, then Harrison. Uh, thank you very much. I know uh, asking a question or commenting towards the home stretch of such a session, one always runs the risk of um, repeating what has already been emphasized over and over. But um, I'll go and hope that I don't fall into that trap. So I have uh, three comments, three questions, one of which um, is a comment that morphs into a question, and I'll just do that briefly. Uh, the first one is that uh, I recently rewatched uh, Program 9 of Ali Mazrui's uh, Triple Heritage, and he gives the example of Liberia in the 18th century, where, sorry, in the 19th century, where after the uh, Africans um, who had initially settled or who had been taken to, the, to America as slaves came back to Nigeria, how they um, uh, relegated the indigenous Africans into the peripheries of power. And uh, that makes me wonder whether our interactions or our experiences uh, with the West, at least with the global North, um, at least the bad experiences, push us to emulate or entice us to emulate that kind of uh, bad behavior and hence uh, perhaps the rise of regional hegemonies even in the global South. So that's the first one. The second one is um, reading the commentary by James Gavi and Harrison Bori on the Kenya-UK um, EPA. Uh, they point out that Kenya stands to lose the most if um, if the if the Kenya if sorry if the ESC EU uh, EPA does not come into force uh, by virtue of Kenya being uh, the only least developed country in uh, the East Af by by virtue of Kenya not be being the only country that is not a least least developed country in the in the ESC. So I wonder uh, when you look at some of these unilateral decisions by countries such as Kenya that has come up a lot during this discussion, whether these moves are premised from um, a, a, a desire by the leaders to sabotage regional integration, or sometimes are they just premised on um, from the background of trying to, you know, su survivalist um, instinct or an existentialist uh, decision, and how we reconcile these two, um, you know, survivalist if it is, and then regional integration, which it does sabotage. And then lastly, um, the question on the issue of negotiations has come up. And in our past lesson with uh, Dr. Titi, at least three or four lessons ago, uh, this question also arose that who are these people negotiating? And uh, towards the beginning of your presentation, you did mention that phase two negotiations of after are going on. And I, I wonder who are, who are the people on the table who are, who are negotiating? And what is the place of you know, scholars like yourself, like Gavi, like Ohio, like Alata, like, the, like Harrison, and um, so that uh, without the risk of leaving out the Nchikos in this list, those are the scholars that I have just come up with at the top of my head. Where is your position in these negotiations? Because the ideas that are being generated here are really, really interesting ideas. And I think if you are on the table and if you are not, perhaps there should be a means or a channel through which these ideas can then get to the table. Uh, so that now the, the negotiations don't end and we have bad deals that have arisen out of the negotiations and then we start to write about what could have been done, you know. Uh, yeah, thank you. That is my, those are my questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Sydney. I mean, very, very interesting uh, questions you've asked. So, so let me quickly, uh, in the interest of time, start from the last one, right? I mean, the negotiators, uh, so you are right. Um, it is the case that... Um, Historically, um, a lot of these negotiations have been done by, um, by a complement of African ministries of uh, uh, government experts, uh, but driven by ideas by, by donors and financiers from the West. Uh, so that is the truth. And I think um, while many years ago, maybe 60s, 70s, 80s, late 90s, you can make the argument that uh, we didn't have uh, expertise to support those negotiations, that is fast changing. Uh, so the first generation of you know, RTAs uh, falls into that category, right? Where they were negotiated perhaps uncritically uh, with the African-centered interests. 
Uh, I think this era of agreements that we're seeing uh, are honestly different. Um, uh, I know that you know some zero drafts are are, are done. Uh, were done by by key figures that you've mentioned that we, you haven't mentioned uh, uh, of some of these agreements. Uh, I know that in the negotiation of the IP uh, section of phase two, there are key figures who are experts on the field in Africa uh, leading it. Uh, Professor Chidio Gomanam, Professor Caroline Sube uh, are at the forefront of, of these ideas. Uh, but you also have the role of organizations and institutions such as UNECA, for example, and that's where it gets murky and interesting, right? Uh, to say, what ideas have these organizations put on the table? Where have their ideas come from? Okay, whose idea prevails at the end of the day? Uh, if they are the primary financiers of these agreements, as I've written in one of the blogs, I think I did, where do you see these other scholars' ideas really driving the agreement at the end. end of the day. And all this is at the forefront of negotiation of the uh, investment protocol, at least Pike, he was involved heavily, uh, but you also have to think about what UNCTAD does. that look at the ministries don't have people no that's not true we have respectable expertise we've had webinars where you know we have a lady from from the ministry of uh, uh, uh from the national investment promotion uh council in nigeria speak so profoundly about what nigeria is doing uh rosalind ngeno who was with the kenyan government and now with the african union spoke about that so we have expertise right the the critical part is the power in terms of what it takes to finance this agreement. You see, we still go to the EU, to the US, uh, and they donate this much money to facilitate the finance the negotiation of what is to be an African-centered uh, trade agreement. That's problematic. It, it's very problematic in that area. So, so yeah, there's role for more, and hopefully as the future gets better, uh, there'll be room for many more people with expertise that center Africans' interest to get to that. To that place. Um, so to combine the other two in the interest of time, um, I think the the question of the uh, I noted it is as as uh, sabotage and and reproduction versus Kenya. I, I think your first two questions are also are also interesting if you think about the fact that we we as a continent um, do, do not do not have it all in today's world, uh, right? Uh, and so, 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 so the question of, of, of sabotage, you know, or moves that are made by, by countries that undermine the aspirations of the broader community, um, I don't think is unique to us. Uh, I think that, uh, that on the spectrum of, of the growth, on the spectrum of development, on the spectrum of, of what drives African interests, uh, we will have instances like that. Uh, it's about how we pull the majority of those of those along the way. And so we should be careful. It's not about demonizing um, a particular state like Kenya. You look at Cote d'Ivoire, they're also in the same bucket, right? Uh, negotiating their own FTA, uh, right? And so, so, so a lot of these things happen. And I think my brother call uh, in response to those two questions, which, which, which you've asked on the other side is, is a little bit of nuance in our understanding uh, and making the case for what is being done here, right? And the, and the critiques that have been written uh, of, of the engagement you see by, by those states uh, that are doing so is written with a good hat that points out to what the continent as a whole may lose uh, if that becomes the new norm in an era of the FCFTA. Okay. Um... Thank you for your answer, Professor. Um, at this point, I wish to highlight that um, we have, of course, a few minutes to go. And in recognition and in cognizance of other, um, other people's um, time, um, we would wish now to 
at least sort of um, converge or you know make the session more compact. Um, so we will take the last question from um, Harrison, and then of course concluding remarks and the sessions from our dignified guests, such as you know um, I see Dr. Titi Adebola is here, um, Professor Gadi, and of course Professor Alata. Yes. Okay. So that's fine by me. Harrison. Yeah. Thank you, uh, BC, for the wonderful presentation. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, and I just wanted to make a few comments, which might um, we might respond to because they are uh, sort of a generalist comment. So I remember when uh, uh, Din uh, Mosen Alat spoke on this forum. He said that one of the biggest problems he thought of is that the ideological base of the entire FTA is wrong, that it's based on the um, neoliberal model that is generally what uh, is, has been prevalent since the early 90s. And therefore, um, when I heard that, I said, okay, that's uh, uh, completely true. But if the entire ideological base is wrong, I wonder whether this thing can benefit Africans. Because I also sort of, in a strong sense, believe that the, the, the ideological base of it is not, is not accurate, but it is more complicated. I mean, life is, is, is more complicated uh, because there, there are certain movements that have to be made. And I think maybe African um, countries are trying. So that was my first comment. Number two is, the, is doctrinal, very doctrinal. And I've had this discussion with uh, uh, Professor Gadi about Article 18, MFN. I wanted to hear what your view is on this. Uh, the, the MFN clause we have on goods specifically, as I read the FT, FCT, is different from that of services. So, so, so that, that's the first thing. A, 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 a Article 4, Article 18 are very different from what are the um, MFN clauses in the services uh, protocol. The second point is that this MFN clause is different from the WTO MFN clause, very different uh, because it then says that if you grant favors or advantages to third parties, you don't need to grant them to uh, the guys in the FT FCFTA immediately and unconditionally. That's my reading. I have to say that there are, uh, there are people who are reading it differently. That's my reading of it. Uh, and uh, that therefore means that Kenya can sign an F F F FTA with the US like we're trying to do. And no one in the FCFTA will claim the benefits that uh, they are in, which will have been the free ridership problem in the WTO. So when I asked this question, uh, raised this problem sometime back when we were in Nairobi, Malaku Desta said, I mean, we have to be clever in our negotiation. So it seems as if from an African country's point of view, they specifically decided that they do not want uh, the WTO MFN clause. And when I read a little bit more about it, it's mainly the North African countries who thought this is crazy. And you can understand why. They said, look, we have zero rated agreements with uh, countries in the Middle East. So I can give you an example of say Tunisia and Jordan. The trade between Tunisia and Jordan is much, much better than you could think about or with Tunisia with any other country in Africa. So Tunisia said, look, if you have an unconditional MFN clause, all these other guys, all these 53 other guys whom are not, we do not have as much good trade with, as, as free as we have with Jordan, are going to free ride on this agreement and on this specific clause. So we have to come up with a different kind of clause. Hmm. Then you go to services, you find the MFN clause that is there in the uh, services agreement in GATS come back up. Uh, and when I spoke to Prof. Gadi about this, he says, I think you mentioned Joy Gekko is the best person to speak about this. Now, thinking about it, uh, the, uh, the listing on schedules and services is, um, in my, I think it is positive, um, positive listing which is good because, you know, everything is out except that which we put in. 
at least if, if people, people who are not familiar with this, this is an interesting idea of liberalization for services. So positive listing says everything is out unless the things we write in. And negative is definitely the opposite. You know, everything is in unless those we sort of write in. And the WTO is negative. And I think in the FCFT, we have gone with the positive. Again, trying to limit this. And I wonder whether that speaks to the um, MFN clause that we have with services. And so that's my doctrinal quagmire. I just wanted to hear you, your views about it because it's, 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 um, it's something that will definitely affect how the agreement is going to be interpreted, at least from a very doctrinal angle. Uh, the last uh, comment is on ISDS. Please, uh, I'm so sorry, allow me some latitude because you mentioned my name uh, on this. You said that uh, th there are people who are rejectionists and reformists. Th th and you, you categorize me as a rejectionist because of the blog I wrote. I said, exit from ISDS. Um, I listened to Professor Jin Ho recently, and she also comes up with this um, two poles on ISDS or international investment law. So she says that what is coming up, and I think she was speaking about ISDS specifically, is that we have the reformist group and we have the rejectionist group. And uh, I find this uh, bifurcation problematic. One, because what ISDS is, is very different from what international investment law is as an area. So ISDS is just a small part of it. It's only the dispute um, resolution uh, aspect of it. So I don't, I don't, I don't know when we, when we say someone is a rejectionist on ISDS, what that person means, at least what I mean is that uh, disputes in investment law should not be resolved in arbitration, at least arbitration as is set up today. They should go to another forum, and there are very many forums. And in that sense, that is not a rejectionist claim. It's actually a reformist claim, only one that is quite radical. So I, I don't know what you think about whether then that is a rejectionist claim or whether it is just a radical reformist claim. Because then you spoke about, and I read your paper on this, uh, reformism can then be a moderate reformism. And I said, and I think you now said you are an incremental reformist. And I'm now saying maybe I am a radical reformist because I'm just saying, let's not go to arbitration, at least even if we can go to arbitration, not the kind that we have right now. And uh, the, the thing that Jin Ho said is interesting, and this is what I'm studying for my thesis, that the ECOWAS court has an arbit arbitral tribunal that can deal with this. The thing is that is it's not set up, uh, you know, and when I, when, I mean, it's there on paper, it looks very good, but the devil, like you said, is in the details. And I've seen some uh, uh, scholars even in, here, here in Europe who have written that this is a good model, maybe for the EU. And, and this makes me very happy because maybe at least the EU can learn something from us. I don't know. But it's just that we haven't set, set it up. But there's also a, a, a similar structure in uh, ESC. We have an arbitral tribunal, the same as ECOS. It's the same. And COMESA also has exactly the same kind of a structure. Yeah. Uh, the setting up is a problem and there are many questions to be asked. So yeah. if that is uh, what Jin Ho said is a middle ground, I think it's part of a radical reformism because you're removing it from arbitration as we know it today and taking it to a standing body to, to make these determinations. Yeah. So, yeah, I've, I've said very many things and I've seen very many comments coming in. So maybe I've said <laughs> the wrong things and I've just, okay, thanks. No, no. So, I mean, thanks a lot, first of all, uh, Harrison, for, uh, for those, um, uh, for those reflections. And, and look, I, I think it's, it's important to just sort of start, right, uh, by acknowledging the fact that, um, at least for me, in this business of, uh, of international economic law in Africa, uh, it's an ongoing uh, journey, journey in learning. Um, uh, so so um, uh, I believe many of those who would have spoken here uh, will speak from a very uh, humble background that we do not know it all, uh, and none of us have the answers to everything. So I'll put that out there first, uh, and thank you for those, uh, for those interventions. Uh, number two is, is really to say, 
let, let me go to the neoliberal ideology uh, model that you said, uh, Dean uh, Alter uh, uh, mentioned, uh, you know, Atara mentioned previously. So, this is it. If we're going to isolate the AFCFTA's ideology uh, as problematic, we might as well speak to the entire system on which we're sitting. So I, I don't think we should make an exception of the AFCFTA, right? My broader argument sits in this space where we're already constrained, right? Uh, that we're already in a system uh, which we failed to retain via the NIEO with our sister states across the continent and across the world uh, by, by way of the third world countries. And so to the extent that we live in a world that is orchestrated by Bretton Woods institutions, uh, fine-tuned by capitalists um, from the global north, uh, layered with racial thinking, um, delivered as Greek gifts, uh, and exploratory in every sense of it, and exploitative in every sense of it, I, I won't isolate one particular one, right? And I think this is where to go to uh, the investment piece paper that, that has been referenced here. I, I had not written on twill at all for a long time. And, and I don't know if people even thought maybe I was a twill person. But you know, from afar, you know that, you know, people would, I, I sure hope they know I am if I didn't write, write on it. I don't think you need to write on twill to be a twill scholar, but, but certainly it was to show that, look guys, the, the critique you levy at 12 for not having a political project is actually not true in the sense that there's an end to the critique that 12 scholars give. We're not just shouting from the top of our voices because we like to shout. There's an end to it. And that I recharacterized what was going on as a response to that, drawing on, you know, uh, Timberly Cren Kimberly Crenshaw and James Hithi and a lot of other scholars that have written there. So to come back to your point, uh, with respect, I would disagree with you and, and Dean Atta that, you know, uh, that we throw away the AFCFTA because its ideology is not uh, one that is African developed. I mean, the other way to respond to this with respect is that the same kind of critique we see in the legal context exists for economists, right? Uh, you think about economic development ideas uh, and you think about that it is just Western leading in terms of all we know that it should be today. And our economists have not had the opportunity to respond with homegrown thinking of what the economics of the development in Africa looks like to inform our thinking, to inform what is the discipline in that area as well, right? So to be clear, he has never suggested throwing it away. And so I take that very well as well, okay? But I think that uh, my point is, if we then agree, it looks like, it becomes what can we do uh, within this confined system that we are in? Uh, and that's where I, I made that uh, sort of argument that I think bleeds into the investment part, you know? I, I, didn't, I don't think I called you a rejectionist my dear brother Harrison, uh, you know, I think that's uh, Jean Howe calling you a rejectionist. You were just radical. And I think you have shown here today that you're radical in the way that your, uh, uh, your comments have elicited responses. And that's okay. I actually benefit from you guys, uh, to use the North American lang language, far left uh, argument, right? About how, where we need to be. Uh, and I just think it is somewhat utopian in some sense. Uh, it's my own view to conceptualize that you have a regime where parties have signed contractual agreement. Julian Rato's piece uh, in private international law and international investment law is interesting in that regard. You guys have, you've signed an agreement. At that point, the, the, uh, <laughs> that's interesting. You can argue that, you know, the laws of, of the agreement is what, what guides it. What pops into my brain is how Professor Gathis' re recent talk makes a claim of the private international law and the problem of racialization. So that, that's why I got caught in there. These things bleed into each other is my, is my argument, right? But, but I don't think that there's, there's a place to run to once you've done that by way of agreement. Uh, you have an agreement to the extent that power inequalities 
is not a problem. To the extent that some of the core things we know about contractual fundamentalism uh, are, not, are not impacted, uh, I think states, once they sign that agreement, are, are in it. That's where argument is about the system in itself. And I think the system uh, is not one that we can eject from, right? I think your argument was that we should just step out of this ISDS regime. I don't think so. I think the intertwined nature of how the existence of investment flow, uh, host states, trans invest investors, all intertwined just means we have to ask questions of how do we gradually shift, right? The place uh, of, 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 of these agreements and how they work. Can we negotiate to have more arbitrators who are of African descent? Can we negotiate to have more transparency within the system? Yes, they are window dressing, but those are the most important things to get the fairest of outcomes, right? Uh, in the first place. And once that is done, then we can scale it up a little bit to ask more important questions about how we can subvert the system. And subverting the system, I'm using it deliberately here, not to radically change. We are working from within, right? To do the works that we want. Uh, and you are doing this maybe without making the most of noise at times in the change you want, uh, not to alert those you are trying to, to deal with. So, so for me, I, 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 you might be, I, I don't think you are a rejectionist, my brother. I think you are a version of reformist. Uh, it's just that, you know, uh, what you see as the reformist in, in your sense um, may leave us with a lot of questions about what, what will be the role of the other actors uh, in the process. Uh, will they stay by and allow you to rewrite the system? Well, I'm not too sure about that. Now, the question of the MFN and, and what, you know, uh, the one in the, in the goods uh, protocol, vis-a-vis -vis the services protocol does, I've seen comments on that from uh, uh, um, Regis Simo and, and Patrick, and I see that you guys are gracious a little bit to allow us go on on this issue. Um, I'll admit, that's not one thing that I have looked at as closely uh, on the Tunisian-Jordan uh, 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 agreement and what it does for the other part. But if I can speak to it, at least from my own conceptual thinking of it, of, of how I've seen it, uh, I think it, at this point, I'm less, to the extent that I don't have the information about what informed the position that the parties took, uh, I think it is okay to see something that is different from the WTO and the FN provision to start with. Um, what it does in terms of the relationship between ourselves as states is very interesting because in my doctoral work, which, which is in the book uh, that is forthcoming, uh, I look at trust as critical uh, to the analysis of our understanding of trade regimes. It hasn't always been said that you think about the role of trust in international economic law, but it is fundamental to what a state gives up in its in economic space and what it doesn't give up. I have to trust that you're going to do that which you have said you would do and not undermine my space, right? And economic sociologists have made this the centerpiece of a lot of their own thinking as broader part of sociolegal analysis, right? So for me, I take this more conceptually rather than the technical one. And I'm happy for Regis and Patrick to come in on, on that. If they know more, I know they've studied more about this technicality, but, but comparing it I, I, in terms of interpretation though, I would think that you read this in line with the other parts of the agreement. And I think an interpreter might, might read it to suggest that uh, no, it is not right on the one hand for you to think that a measure that has been extended to a third party will not be taken advantage of by a party within the African region. Uh, why do I say so? You have to also look at the regional economic groups for which this particular agreement says it's a quick, it's part of their own uh, thinking for this. So I think an interpretation of it, you may find will be broad and not agree with what our Northern African uh, uh, sister states uh, really say should be the interpretation. Uh, the motivation may be different, but I think an interpretive exercise uh, would be a very interesting one to see in terms of how this uh, plays out. The technical aspect, I'm happy for Regis, uh, Patrick or Dean Atta uh, uh, to, to, to speak to. 
The ECOWAS arbitration one, uh, I think Matthew Happold, uh, Revik, a couple of guys have written about this, uh, and I have something that I've reflected on it. I'm not as optimistic as you uh, when it comes to the, to the investment arbitration regime uh, that is there. I think we all hope that that will take the drive uh, forward, uh, but you do have to ask yourself whether, whether we are there, right, uh, with respect to these. If you look at it, the 1970, uh, five ECOWAS Treaty, which established the, the agreement, um, really has this arbitration uh, provision, which anticipates that it's to be set up. It was not done. Uh, the revised one had it, and then they drafted, you know, this this protocol, which, which is the draft, uh, which which has been taken up, which a lot of scholars are seeing uh, a number of rising scholars number are seen as a potential uh, uh, alternative. I, I'm just not sure what it does differently in terms of, you know, uh, looking at the ECOWAS regime itself, which is now on the back foot with respect to everything that is at the heart of core integration uh, in that region, at least in comparison to its EAC uh, sister uh, or the OHADA sister. It, it's not just looking uh, right. Uh, so I'm less, less optimistic uh, about its potential to reform how we think about arbitral regimes. Uh, but to, to cap my response to you, th these are great questions. Uh, these are great questions I think that personally I'll reflect on even more. Uh, but I, uh, but I, 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 I'd like to think that we can contribute. Uh, and we know we contribute to the broader discourse of international economic law as African uh, scholars and practitioners and what it means. Uh, I think we shouldn't forget the key role of uh, law firms and practitioners in this space, especially of arbitration. Uh, the scholars are not the most important actors in there. It's the practitioners. So I have derived personal joy uh, seeing law firms take up uh, roles about how they see uh, the, 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 the investment, uh, uh, the dispute settlement mechanism of the FCFTA and its potential for the investment playing out uh, eventually. And I think that's something we can respond to uh, to help these folks. Uh, because again, at the end of the day, they are concerned about profits, uh, you know, which, which is fair, they're a law firm. Uh, but the fact that they are seeing themselves as key actors speaks to the broader age we are in Africa about international economic law. And one that we have to be very aware of not to shoot down too early, especially when we consciously, unconsciously uh, judge it through the lens of other schemes elsewhere. Great questions, Harrison. I don't know if I did justice to any of them, uh, if I've just rumbled, forgive me. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Professor. So we've come to the end of our session, uh, the second part of our session, which has been the, quest the lecture and the question and answer session. And um, of course, in my capacity as the um, host here, I think I would be doing a justice to the rest of the participants and saying that we really do appreciate the session that you have brought to us. Um, of course, we see in the chat here that you have raised a lot of um, critical questions that we should in fact be asking, not only as the AFCFTA is being launched, but even in the process of, you know, in the manner in which it, it will be carried out if it is indeed carried out. Um, so of course, at this point, um, we note that we have taken much of your time and you are free to leave if you have any pressing um, you know, any other pressing matters to attend to. But let me um, say to Nigerian, just sorry, Joy, let me say it. Yeah, yeah, it's okay, it's okay. Die here, you know? So this is. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for those who said that, who have intimated that you would sleep here, um, we would wish now to go to the third session, which is, of course, inviting to the floor the very distinguished members of our panel. Um, first, we would want to hear from Professor Mohsen Alata. And then we shall hear from Dr. Titi Adebola, if she's still, if she's still here. And of course, um, I, I think we should wrap it up with um, Professor Gabi. I would, add, I would add Harrison, but I think he has said his piece so far. And so um, he has intimated what he, what he thought about the session. So, yes. May I, may I make a, my kind suggestion, Dinata, sorry. Maybe before we go to Professor Gathi, if um, Dr. Simo could just make uh, a reflection as well, 
I, I'm sorry, uh, Joy, but, but he's a great voice here too. Thanks. Of course, we can add him after Professor Gabi. Excellent. So uh, many thanks uh, then for uh, the invitation to uh, speak, Joy. Uh, and of course, thanks to you, BC, for a very stimulating then talk. Uh, it was as good as we had expected. So there are only uh, two comments that I'll make, and uh, one obviously builds on uh, what uh, Harrison uh, accused me of. Um, and the other one then is um, almost building on, or not <coughs> almost, is directly building on something that you said. So the first one then has to do with this sort of ideology then surrounding it, the ideology surrounding the FTA. And I, I suppose what I was trying to point out in my own talk is that there is an, an inverse correlation between development and underdevelopment. And this is a point that is often lost on us. And what do I mean when I say this point is lost on us? What I mean is that we, we, we imagine then that there is somehow uh, these resources or this wealth or this economic activity that is somehow floating there in the ether that we just need to appropriate. When we know full well that uh, the way that Asia has uh, succeeded in terms of its um, intra-continental trade has simply meant that it has resulted in a reduction of the manufacturing base and the type of trade that was once taking place between the United States and the Asian continent. So as we have one area developing and growing then its manufacturing, its industrial base, then it is clawing back some from elsewhere. And this is where we go back to the work of Walter Rodney and Walter Rodney's book, the title still captures this essentially then how Europe underdeveloped Africa. And the point that I had made even in the talk is that Europe is built on then African bodies. That is the, uh, the essence then of the whole racial capitalism argument in that we're saying that within capitalism and thus as a result within international economic law, which is the regulatory regime for global capitalism, we have exploitation. Now that exploitation is of ecology, yes, but the exploitation is also of peoples. So the question that I've always asked when teaching international economic law, I always say, who are we going to exploit to develop? Because the model of development that has been uh, circulated is based on naked exploitation. And we are now imagining then that the FTA is going to facilitate a type of non-exploitative then economic growth when that has never happened. It has never manifested. It has never taken place. And so until we resolve that conundrum, this is where I say the ideology underpinning the FTA merely replicates the models that are already in circulation. And to be clear, and this is why I made that point in the end where I said not throw it away, I am all for clawing back some of the economic activity that is taking place in Europe, that is taking place in the Americas, that is taking place then in Asia, so as to achieve some type of intracontinental development. I'm certainly in favor of that, undoubtedly. But I understand that this is going to come at the expense of others, and that is necessarily contentious, adversarial in character because of the competitive nature of the global economy. So that was really the point around that one. It was acknowledging then that element of exploitation that I think we're largely then shelving or dismissing too readily. The second point that I'd make, and this relates then directly to what you said in terms of turning to the EU or turning to the Americans, you're bringing up the issue of dignity. And I very much appreciate that. And what I find then as far as the FTA is concerned is that the FTA is a statement of African dignity. It's a statement in African dignity in terms of saying simply, as in, we are not going to be uh, railroaded, right, throughout history um, by other powers. And the conflict arises when we still have to depend on others in trying to decide then that way forward. So the challenge then for us is that we are still embedded within these global value chains. We are still embedded within these intellectual right, value chains as well. And as a result, we still have to rely then on Europe and the Americas and so on. And so I take your point when you say, when you say that we have these experts out there and we're encountering these experts in these talks, in these ministries, in these law firms and so on. 
But you and I both then were circulating this article that came out in Development Economics earlier this week, and we were pointing to how neoclassical even our economists, our African economists are. And so the result then is that the intellectual capital that we have across the continent is itself still informed by the epistemologies right, of others. And that is where that issue of dignity comes up. As much as we're relying then on the financial resources of others, we're also relying on the intellectual resources, the epistemological resources of others. And that to me is the greater dignity challenge that we face since we are embedded with the system them. So how is it that we actually break away? Again, these are almost impossible conundrums, but worth reflecting on, particularly with this type of an audience that is considering what comes next and how they can be involved in this struggle. So I'll end there and thanks very much, BC. It was fantastic. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dina Char. It's, um, it's, I mean, thank you so much for making time to, to be here, first of all, today. Uh, look, I, I agree with you, and, and you know, I, I want to be conscious of time for folks here. Uh, I think the only thing I'll, I'll add is to say that you know, when it comes to African expertise, um, uh, I, I think we, we should, it bears repeating, they are doing their best, right? Uh, but it is the case that we need a critical mass of us uh, to do the kind of things that we are speaking about here. And uh, I said we die here, uh, right, the Nigeria way, because how often does one get treated to this? I know Professor Gadi has said it, that he's waited all his life to have this kind of conversation. Uh, but, but the joy to just not talk Europe talk or Canadian talk, but delve into these issues with people who are passionate with it uh, is, is, a, is a blessing in itself. Uh, so, so, yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Dina Char. And the next one would be Dr. Titi Adebola, if she's willing to, of course, contribute to the session. Okay, so thank you so much, Joy, and thank you, BC, for your thought-provoking um, presentation. I'll just make mine very short. Uh, I thought that it was uh, very useful for us to keep having these conversations. So I'm reminded of the eminent Nigerian novelist, uh, Chino Achebe, that says that, until the lions have their own historians, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. I think it's time for all stakeholders, academics, students, legal practitioners, government policy uh, officers to come to the table, drawing on empirical evidence, drawing on real life practical examples of the realities uh, that are ongoing in our different constituencies uh, and to bring those those examples to the table in our discussions, in our negotiations. So when we're talking about intellectual property examples that uh, BC also raised, you talked about uh, Professor Chidio Guamana, Caroline Nkube, discussing the intellectual property protocol. We are aware that while we have the expertise on the continent on the different intellectual property subject matters, we are somewhat sometimes short uh, by the finance, so by how we are going to fund the discussions, how we are going to fund the, for example, uh, if we're talking about drugs, you know, what is going to happen at the national levels in terms of manufacturing capacity. Let's take Nigeria as an example. I was having this conversation with a friend and I said at the time when we went into lockdown was when Nigerian uh, universities decided to go on strike and the government did not respond to that. So while the whole world was going into research and development, we were the Nigerian intellectuals that could have come up with uh, their own versions of vaccines and therapeutics were at home because the government could not respond to that demand. And so we've had these conversations ongoing at the national So we've had these conversations going on at the national levels. And I think at a time when regionalism, when we are having questions around multilateralism, and we're having, for example, at, in the EU with Brexit, we're having questions around how to pull together, how to keep together a block. 
Africa can come as an example at this point to bring together the resources we have at the different national levels uh, from the diaspora uh, to come to the table to bring uh, a progressive, a forward-looking uh, trade agreement that can serve as an example on the different uh, subject matters for the world. So I think this is an important time in history. And I know that all of the conversations that we are having will form a collage, a portfolio of resources and information that would be drawn uh, back to and would be referred to. So at this time, while we might think that we're having academic exercises and discussions. I know that the policymakers are listening to what we're doing and are reading the work that we're putting forward. So I'd encourage us all as students, uh, as, as academics to keep uh, pushing, to keep writing. And I know that all of this information will be useful uh, now at this point and in history when we are looking back to the making of the AFCFTA. So thank you very much, BC, for that thought-provoking presentation. And we look forward to reading more of your excellent work. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Adebola, for, for the generous uh, comments. And of course, I cannot forget uh, uh, plugging in her own work uh, here, uh, because in the, in the, in the, in the inaugural issue of, of, the, of the African Journal of International Economic Law, she wrote on uh, what was a very excellent piece and, and you know, not one that many scholars have, have reflected on. Uh, I hope it came up in the course of our work, but, but it's highly recommended, guys. Uh, she's, she's a breath of fresh air in that field. So thank you very much. So of course, at this point, I wish to invite Professor Levy to um, make any additions and contributions on reflection. Well, thank you. Uh, so I'll be very brief. Uh, first to congratulate the never sleeping BC um for a really great talk uh, uh i was glued uh, taking notes and uh, uh that was really good like everybody has said this forum um has turned out to be uh, a really great uh resource uh and uh, thanks so much joy for that great moderation to everybody for those really good questions um you have all made this a really vibrant uh, uh, place, like uh, like uh, both uh, Dean Mawson and uh, and uh, Dr. Adebola have have mentioned, and I'm really proud of that. Um, so, what what else can be done? So, first, uh, I think maybe Dr. Adebola can tell us about the upcoming African International Economic Law Network Conference, uh, because that's another of the places where these discussions are going to be taking place. Uh, the second is bring uh, more to Afronomics law. The discussion continues on Afronomics law. Uh, the African Journal of International Economic Law is also open uh, to continue these conversations. Um, I know that uh, Dean Mawson uh, is, is, is planning many things and we are going to be collaborating uh, with uh, the Caribbean as well and, uh, and everything else that he does so that uh, we can enhance these networks. Um, I mean, the only other last thing I'm going to say is that I had many terms, reformists, moderates, radicals, incrementalists, rejectionists. I, I'm just going to say I'm just an old foggy. I'm just here learning and I'm delighted that this is happening. And uh, I hope that it continues. Uh, the ball is only in your court. Uh, you can't let it drop. Uh, you just can't let it drop. That's all I want to say. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, if I could, there was oh, yes. something about the uh, colloquium. Yes. So thank you so much, uh, Professor Gathi, for your great comments. So speaking on the African International Economic Law Colloquium, it's holding on the 23rd and 24th of July. We put out a call for papers and we have uh, closed that. We have shortlisted uh, some of the papers for presentation and we're going to have uh, a two day event with presentations from different panelists covering uh, some of the important subject matters in relation to international economic law in Africa. And we're also organizing other talks that would be relevant to us in this forum. So for example, we're going to be having discussions around uh, career trajectories and uh, 
and progress uh, as international economic law scholars uh, from the global south. We're also going to have uh, some interesting keynotes, uh, uh, speeches uh, from eminent scholars and practitioners. So we'll put up more of the information about the colloquium and we hope to see us all there. Thank you. <laughs>